everybody. Here with my friend Chris Farmer from American Bird uh -huh. Conservancy. And uh, thanks for talking with me. So you were helpful to me right from the beginning of the book. You looked at the sketches. And uh, I wanted to share with everybody that moment sure. when I was struggling. And that was, I wanted to show you the sketches anyway, but I was just kind of like, ah. Um, just because I was, I was torn between accuracy, trying to make the birds look like they, right. we think that they looked, and um, giving them life. So do you remember when you looked at the sketches what you thought? I do, because we'd been having dinner and we went up to, you were struggling, you mentioned this. And I looked and the sketches were impressive. You see from Karen's book that her artwork is amazing. It speaks to you. And her sketches are incredible, but she was very, I mean this in a positive way, but very caught up and stuck with biological accuracy being strictly physiologically uh, specific and correct, which is great, but can be really difficult if you're trying to communicate some of the greater meaning and some of the, the power of these birds. And so as we're talking, the idea of this, it's a dream, it's this boy's vision of the world. And once you realize that, the dreams have a, a lot of times a greater truth but they don't have to be biologically accurate. The birds can be, they can be more meaningful in certain ways so that you don't have to be bound by the strict limits of the biology. You know, I'm, I'm a biologist. I got my doctorate in ecology. I'm all for strict, but when you're in a dream, you can really let the artistic uh, vision take you and drive the, the story. I think that that's what I, I said. And to me, it seemed like a kind of just describing your process and kind of possibilities, but it did seem to really ignite a fire in me, which I was happy to help out in a little bit. It totally did. And what you said just now actually is really interesting and it hadn't occurred to me, but that idea that um, actually something that might not be inaccurate, but captures an emotion or conveys or, or incites an emotion can be more effective than perfect Definitely. accuracy. So that's really great. At the time, when you said that, I was just kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I remember you got very just excited, started oh. drawing. And just it went from a you were clearly like a I don't know it was an artist block, it's not like a writer's block, but you seemed stuck. And then all of a sudden, the creativity just burst it out. It was amazing. I was just happy to witness it. It, it was, was so. As someone who has almost no artistic, <laughs> I, I do good on stick people, but that's about it. But yeah, I did feel incredible freedom after that because it was almost like you were giving me license to just express myself. But suddenly, I could see like what the birds looked like. Mm -hmm. Before that, I, I couldn't because I was looking at a lot of skins in, in the Bishop Museum. Well, that's tough when you're dealing with, unfortunately, an extinct bird, extinct yeah, birds, especially. is we don't have good pictures. I mean, the pictures we have in our grainy and the skins are never lifelike. And so something like this is a majestic bird. You read some of the uh, earliest accounts and they talk about them flying in huge flocks and just you look at them trying to imagine with the colors and those feathers trailing behind them. Right. You can't get them biologically accurate, but you can get them emotionally accurate. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. So in case you all are not familiar with Chris, I wanted to talk about the work that oh, you sure. do with American Bird Conservancy, which yeah. ties into this book, and that is to inspire people to conserve the birds that we have left. It's, it's sad. We're losing um, endemic birds all the time. And it's not, it's not just the OO bird. I mean, there are so many birds that we have lost in the last recent time. Yeah. I mean, it's really bad. So um, please tell our audience about what the work that you're doing, that you do throughout Hawaii and also getting closer to home. Sure. That is a big, big topic, so I'll try it. Um, is I work with American Bird Conservancy and we're a small nonprofit. Um, I'm a Hawaii program director, which means that I'm in charge of projects from the Big Island, which is where I'm at now, and where me and Karen live, all the way out to Lay Sand. So if you, uh, for a lot of people who aren't familiar, the Hawaiian Islands go all the way out to the Northwest. And some of you might have heard of Midway, but there's all the islands interconnecting them. And there are endemic birds on nowhere else in the world, most of them. And ABC has recognized that Hawaii is one of the jewels of biodiversity in the world, and it's probably the extinction capital of the world. And so we have prioritized this 
and I am fortunate enough to be able to run our projects out here and be able to try and save these birds. And we have done as a project on almost every island. We've worked on the big island on Palila, trying to save it from going extinct. It has about a thousand individuals, and so we're saving it from habitat loss and the effects of climate change and non-native predators. On Kauai, we work with the endemic birds there, the Akikiki, Akeke, and Huaiohi. Uh, Puaiohi has about 400 to 500, Kikiki about 500, KKA less than 1,000. And the reason why I keep rattling off these numbers is when I talk with people on the mainland, like, oh, we have an endangered bird. It has like 20,000, 50,000. Like, all of the endangered birds in Hawaii are less than that. But the scope of the problem here is just really hard for a lot of times to grasp. And it can be a little overwhelming, but um, we can make a difference and we are making a difference. We also worked out in the Northwest Islands with some of the seabirds, but also uh, moving millerbirds from a real tiny island called Nihoa back to an island that they were extirpated from called Lake Sand. We move these birds out there after the habitat had been restored, release them, and they've done gangbusters. They've gone more than triple. Um, so the population is expanding out there, and it's really been a uh, one of the big success stories. So doing all this project across the islands has really been fortunate. We've made a difference and really started to help these birds. But unfortunately, with climate change and global warming, uh, the habitat is starting to change. And unfortunately, one of the biggest factors driving these birds extinct is starting to become more uh, extreme, is there were no native mosquitoes in the Hawaiian Islands uh, before Westerners arrived, and there was no avian malaria or avian pox. When Westerners arrived and brought those, those diseases wiped out many of the birds. If you look around at the lowlands now, you don't see many of the birds. I mean, the O'O bird, that uh, Karen talks about in her books. There are four different species. Those went extinct relatively quick after Western arrival because of non-native diseases that are transmitted by non-native mosquitoes. Um, you know, so most of them in kind of the mid 1800s and up into the early 1900s. And so one of the big projects that myself and ABC are focused on right now is working ways to break this cycle. But as temperatures warm, the mosquitoes and disease are moving up the mountains. Uh, we find them breeding now year round up in the forest bird habitat on Hawaii. And that was the problem with the Kiwiku translocation that I mentioned, mm -hmm. is we had done mosquito surveys and there were almost no mosquitoes where we were bringing them. It was a low level. Uh, and they were at a level equal to a lot of other places that forest birds can survive with no problem. So we thought it was safe. But when we translocated the birds, the population had exploded. The population of mosquitoes had exploded. And they transmitted malaria amongst those birds and caused the entire translocation to fail. Most of those birds died, um, which has been horrible and uh, really traumatic for all of us involved. And so now we're trying to figure out ways to save the QQ from going extinct uh, in the time we have left. And one of the best will be to use um, some sort of mob actually getting bit by mosquitoes as we speak, um, is to use a bacteria called Wolbachia, which is super common. There's about 60% of all insects in the world have this. By some estimates, it's the most common bacteria in the world. And so it's super common out in the wild. But if you have a different strain of bacteria in the mosquitoes, you can cause it to not be able to reproduce successfully. It's in effect, mosquito birth control. Mm -hmm. And so we are working with a lot of partners, Fish and Wildlife Service, the state of Hawaii, many different labs, University of Hawaii, Michigan State, to try and get this uh, technique developed to be able to deploy that to cause the population of mosquitoes to decline here. I choose worldwide, I can't remember how many countries, I think it's 17 different countries, over a dozen different countries, uh, and in multiple different states for human health purposes, because diseases that are vectored by mosquitoes, this is a very safe way, so it's used worldwide. There's not been any problem with it, so I'm not concerned about that, it's just, it's not been used with this particular species of mosquito, and it's not been used for conservation. It's only ever been used for human health. So we are scaling up uh, the, the scale, the, the spatial scale mm -hmm. that is we're going to try and apply this for. So we are hopeful, but it's still a lot of work ahead of us to get this uh, deployed and to save the birds. Um, and something else that's unusual and you know, kind of tragic about Hawaii is I mentioned the OO when they went extinct, and you know, that's 
mind blowing that this whole family of birds, uh, there were the four different OO species, they all went extinct by 1987, I think was when the quiet OO was last seen. And um, I don't know if you can put the vocalization in that, but that yep. is the most haunting, the same, same perhaps, uh, the most haunting the vocal you'll ever hear. Yeah. And that was the last call of that species, of that entire family mm -hmm. going extinct. Mm -hmm. This is birds that have been around for 14 to 18 million they were years. The first. Yeah. They were the first. Some of the first birds to arrive here, which it, it just kind of is mind blowing that you say these birds arrived. And that's about the time that Laysan Island was the Hawaiian Islands. Like all the ones that people have visited, Oahu, Kauai, et cetera, those are like five million. Those are youngins. Mm -hmm. So this bird was around here before any of this land, and then humans wiped it out. And I mean, I, Very quickly. It, it's just really tragic. But it's not something that's happened in the way past. It wasn't like 1800. Mm -hmm. Is as recently as 2004, there's a bird called a pouli that was just discovered in the late 70s. They tried to do some research, find out how it was doing. It weren't many of them. And by 2004, this bird went extinct. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that was motivating a lot of the work with the Kiwi Q because it was found in the same areas. One of the camps is Pouli camp. And one of the several of the people on the project were part of that team. And so mm -hmm. extinction is something that haunts, but also motivates everyone who works in Hawaii. Is that, having learned from that yeah. experience so from moving forward. What can be it is, because with Pouli, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of analysis paralysis. Like, mm -hmm. we can't do anything. Why don't we do something wrong? And so the species went extinct. And so even if you don't make a decision, that is a lack of action that will lead to extinction, is the birds don't have a long period of time. With KiwiQ, we, I'm on that working group meeting, we talked about how to save the species. And if those are some of the most heart-wrenching decisions, you say, well, how long do we have? And you don't really know, because there's a lot of different factors, but three to 10 years is kind of the timeline you're talking about. And so that is extinction in, you know, in our generation. And the same goes true for most of the other species I mentioned earlier, is that 10, 20, maybe a little bit longer, but this generation, you know, people, me, everyone watching this, this is our decision. This is something that we can make a difference or not. And, you know, I certainly and Karen, you know, we're motivated to make a difference and we hope that you are too by learning about the Hawaiian birds. But. Right, and doing things like specifically for mosquitoes, like I talk about in the book, it's just not keeping standing water around your house. I mean, things like that do make mm -hmm. a difference. But I mean, even living here in Volcano, I've noticed the, the heat rising over the years and the mosquitoes. The like mosquitoes the, have gotten... When I moved here, there yeah. were no mosquitoes here and now there are, so they're just yeah. chasing the birds farther and farther. Just up over the, the last 10 years, they've gotten horrible. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear, but apapani are still very common at my house. Mm -hmm. But talking with some people who've been here for a long period of time, they say Eevee used to be here. Right. And the, an Eevee is another honey creeper that is really hard to find. It's super yeah. sensitive. One bite of an effect by an infected mosquito and it can die of malaria. Yeah. That's one of the things I really am excited about your book mm -hmm. is one of the biggest problems we have, unfortunately, is most people have not seen the Hawaiian native birds. Right. Is we go out and say, oh, we're gonna save these birds. These birds are from North and Hawaii. And they'll say, oh, that's great. Like that red one, which is a house finch, or that yellow one, which is a saffron finch, right. or that brown one, which is a mina. And for all the people who are not bird nerds, those are all birds from elsewhere in the world. They're doing great, which, and that's no, I mean, I'm not sad about that, but it doesn't, those birds are not in danger. These birds are not and they get along great. They're used to avian disease. They have no trouble to get along with people. Mm -hmm. But things like Apapani, Eevee, Amasihi, which are the most common birds, even those people are unfamiliar with. Mm -hmm. And so Karen's book that has these pictures talks about that and makes the connection from OO, which again tragically went extinct. Mm -hmm. Very few people have seen those alive to the birds like Palila, that there's only a thousand left in the world and you can go one place in the world to see them, right. to something like an Apapani that is pretty common. I tragically heard people who live in Hilo, which is 45 minutes down the slope, mm -hmm. who've never seen Apapani. Yeah. They come here and they, they see it, just come up to the national park. Right. 
And so a book like this can hopefully motivate people and make them understand why it's important that we deploy these modified mosquitoes, that we save the birds, that we save Hawaii's biological heritage, that the United States, the world. I mean, That's these, right. That's right. I, I mean, these, I can't, I don't know if I can express it much better than that, but these are unique, priceless individuals that will never be seen again if we let them go. That's right. Yeah. And that's what I try to do is to really make the birds come to life. So even if people never get a chance to see them, they can hopefully feel some kind of a connection with them. So. And that's critical because unfortunately Hawaii has a really difficult geography in the sense that most of the native birds are only found up in these high mountain uh, refuges or national wildlife refuges or forests because of the mosquitoes, because that's where the habitat remains. But most of the people live down on the beaches or they live over in Oahu. So it is difficult for people to see these birds and they have to make the effort. And so books like Karen's and there, there are other books too that are invaluable uh, resources that go out and say, look, these are what we're talking about. They help and the art is powerful and makes that connection you know, we're talking about at the beginning, the kind of the emotional connection. And so the people can see that, you know, this OO, this the boy who was named after the OO, we don't have to do that for things like Apapani, Kalila, and uh, the Ivy. And hopefully not for things not like <laughs> for Kiwi Q and the Kiki Ki, that you know, one of the fears is that these can go extinct that's with right. a hurricane or a bad year. So that's right. And that's the idea. It's it's that there are Plenty, there have been extinctions, and it's really sad, but there are these birds that are still here, and these are the kinds of things that are being done to help them, and we can help. We can help by supporting the work at ABC. We can learn more and, and teach other people, share with other people how cool Hawaiian birds are. Yes, <laughs> yes. yeah, just educating people about the threats. I mean, most of the different islands and different programs have uh, habitat restoration where you can go out and plant trees and help to recreate the native forest. And that's critical because we need that forest for the birds. Right, because so, so many of these birds, the native birds, they have that kind of relationship. Yeah. It's very specific. They eat one kind of a seed yeah. and, that's, and it has to be there for them. Yeah, so if you're on one of the Hawaiian islands and reach out, there's probably some locals doing habitat restoration, which will help to save the native birds. Yeah. Well, Thank you so much. It's You're welcome. Well, thank you for really fun to talk with you. creating the book. It's, it's an impressive piece of work. <laughs>